Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Raff, and I'm here to tell you about all the wonderful things that are happening in and around the city of Missoula with events, some news items, a little bit of fun videos along the way. But let's kick things off with a little bit of weather. It is uh, it's looking a little rainy this weekend as well. If you guys are planning on going out and about this weekend or even today, it currently is 34 degrees outside. Your high is going to be 48 t uh, today. Your low is going to be 35 um, with a 30% chance of rain happening tonight. By Saturday, things are warming up. Unfortunately, you might see some chance showers happening pretty much all day Saturday and Saturday night. Sunday, there's uh, uh, percentages increase into your Sunday night. And then by Monday, 80% chance of showers are happening those days. But you got those spring showers happening with highs into the 50s. So uh, you can expect the weather to kind of stay pretty good with uh, some good pr uh, pre precipitation as well. But it's not as bad as some of the uh, weather that the bear um, over in Glacier uh, National Park has been dealing with. So here's a, a, a a video from yesterday of w of a fairly heavy snowstorm. So as you let's just take a look. So here's uh, basically the bear in the stump. Wait for it. Wait for it. he's gonna do something. He's gonna do so. I promise. Oh, he peeks out and he goes back down. So that's basically all the bear did yesterday during the snowstorm was stay with inside his stump. But of course, let's take a look at it live right now. Oh look, he is moving. Now it's Bear Watch 2018. See, look, he's actually moving. This is live from um, <laughs> Glacier National Park. He's just kind of chilling out, looking up, looking around. He might do something today, he might not. And they've had so many different live streams of this bear doing things. I think the bear got out uh, twice during this live coverage since they started covering it on um, the 8th of this month. Wow, so majestic in that stump of his. Okay, so <laughs> we'll, we'll give you more updates on <laughs> what the bear is not doing today as well later on in the show as well. So, of course, uh, locally here in, the, in Missoula, the University of Montana faculty leaders are bracing for new, next week's proposed uh, reductions expected to hit tenured co uh, colleagues and academic programs. Um, in an article of the Missoulian by Kayla uh, Spalzer, um, some uh, faculty acknowledged UM must finally make decisive and adequate cuts once and for all. Interim Provost uh, Paul uh, Greeris says UM President Seth Bodner aims to cut $5 million from the campus budget which has a $10 million problem using three separate stat strategies. Of course, the only thing apparent in these budget cuts for the UM is the message of sugarcoating. Um, but many faculty wants transparency, or in, my or in my opinion, a phone call that tells them that their department's going to be cut by X amount of money for X, for X amount of reason. So you have uh, so many meetings, but most people at this point are are like how much time do I have and how much uh, can I uh, how much money do I have and how much can I spare to lose I think that seems to be the big thing it's nothing new uh, budget cuts have been going on over a year and um, Seth Bodner is basically kind of inheriting this and he's just like oh, okay so transparency is really important it's just like and that's what the university has been doing for the last like six plus months about this it's kind of it's kind of hard not to be transparent when you say hey your budgets are going to be cut. All right, in state, the last couple of days, uh, some U.S. House uh, and Senate folks came down to Steely Lake. Uh, we have a lot of Republicans uh, clamoring to take on the incumbent tester in this upcoming election. So the primary is heating up. You guys will get to vote for any of those candidates uh, coming up in June. So that's the uh, primary. Um, Gianforte's ticket is also up this year with a little less than a year on ser service based on the special election last year. Um, of course, in other news, a plan announced Thursday that would boost uh, basically uh, park fees in national park fees in the state of Montana by five dollars, which is up from the current thirty dollars, but far b uh, below the figured eternal proposed last fall. Because at one point they wanted to charge seventy dollars to entrance an entrance way to like Glacier or Yellowstone National Park, but they're going to basically go from thirty to thirty-five dollars. The plan announced Thursday said a five-dollar increase for the parks that charge entrance fees. Parks that previously charged. $15 will now charge 20, 20, 25, 25, and so on. Um, the current $30 fee is, uh, is the highest 
charged by park services and applies to 17 most visited parks, um, more than two thirds of national parks will remain free to enter. There's a couple of uh, national parks that are free to enter. Um, it's the ones that have, uh, usually it's the ones that have in educational centers and gift shops, basically that will increase these fees because they have uh, like education centers in their national parks. They usually need the money and interest fees to help maintain those kind of facilities as well as uh, some of the maintenance for some of the trails they built. Um, a lot of times when you build a trail, they want to make sure that people stay on the trail. But a lot of times, if you've ever been to Glacier National Park, you know that there's always some uh, jerk that climbs on the area that he's not supposed to climb on. Then you hear a bunch of people yelling, hey, get off there. You're not supposed to climb up there. Like they can't hear you. Okay. That's just me ranting. Anyways, in national news, according to NPR, the U.S. has only accepted 11 refugees from Syria this year. And uh, as a result, humanitarian organizations are challenging uh, the President Donald Trump's commitment to humanity when it comes to Syrian civilians, particularly those seeking refuge in the United States. In 2006, near the end of Barack Obama's presidency, the U.S. resettled 15,479 Syrian refugees. According to State Department figures, in 2017, the country let in 3,000. So far this year, that number is just 11. By comparison, over the last same three and a half months period in 2016, um, U.S. accepted 790 compared to the 11 that's going on right now. So last September, President Trump dramatically reduced the annual cap for, for refugees from anywhere in this world to 45,000 people, basically saying that if other countries take refugees, that is just as good as them coming here. Um, you remember that travel ban passed almost a week into Trump's um, office, uh, and the whole federal judges of Hawaii and others, uh, and another state who uh, contested that it is unconstitutional. But of course, it seems to kind of still be going, and I don't think it has even uh, even touched the Supreme Court or the Ninth Circuit at all. So Trump has not yet decided whether to launch an attack in Syria, as he did in 2000 in April 2017, when the administration said it was responding to reports that Syrian regime used chemical weapons on civilians. So that in, that news and information is from NPR.org. You can also find uh, from the Missoulian. And as well, MCAT will be showing uh, the candidates form on our channel, um, one, uh, I believe it's 189 or 190. You can check it out. It's You just have to type in um, candidates form on MCAT.org. But speaking of programs, um, if you guys are interested in watching any of these upcoming programs that are going to be airing on MCAT, you can go to MCAT.org. I'll have a little more information later on the show about where you can go to find out more on MCAT. So stay with me. I still, I still got plenty more show to go. I got pre-critic coming up after this. It's really hard to work with somebody who's in detention. You have to, but you got to go through the security, and you know you can. You have to set up time, so it's it's a lot easier to defend somebody when they're at liberty. Right? They can help you. Uh, they can help you track down witnesses and evidence. Okay, so we know there's no question that it harms poor defendants. Okay, and there's lots of evidence and lots of science on this. I'm happy to share with anybody. I can give you some citations, and it has marginal safety benefits. Ostensibly, the reason we keep people in bail or keep people in jail pending trial uh, is to keep the community safe. But what they found is that as long as you can peel off the folks who present a community danger, keeping a nonviolent, low-level offender in jail, has it doesn't keep us safer, but it costs us a lot of money. So the Upper mm -hmm. Green, if you've seen the new Wyoming license plates, this is the scene that's on the license plate. It's Square Top Mountain on the upper right and the Upper Green River probably the second most spectacular river in Wyoming after the snake flowing past the Tetons. Um, the Upper Green was in the original Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, in the original bill, but Wyoming's two senators insisted that it be removed from the bill. And so it was never protected in 1968. And since that time, dams have been proposed repeatedly 
in this area. And it's an incredibly special place. There's more wetlands along the Upper Green River than any place in Wyoming, 174,000 acres of wetlands. So tons of waterfowl, tons of wildlife. Uh, there's a hot springs there with an endemic species called the Kendall Warm Springs Dace. It's a fish about three inches long. It exists nowhere else on Earth. The Upper Green River is where the path of the pronghorn is. So all the pronghorn that migrate from Grand Teton National Park to the Red Desert in southwest Wyoming use this river corridor, as well as the, the longest mule deer migration in the lower 48 states uses the Upper Green River. So this is an exceptionally important fish and wildlife habitat. It's been threatened by dams. Uh, there were two dams proposed in 2015. We finally extinguished those. So it's perpetually threatened with really high values, so it's at the top of my list. So after the 2010 earthquake, um, Pat Robertson came on TV and said, you know, don't we think that this all happened to Haiti because they're evil? They've made a pact with the devil. I don't know if any of you here heard that. Anybody here hear, hear that? All right. So um, because when in 1804, when the, when the slaves revolted and got their freedom, Many people at the time said, these, these black people aren't smart enough to do all those things that they say. They must have made this pact with the devil because they do this voodoo practice. And, and they beheaded a pig under this big tree. And so there's this, these pictures of, of this, this voodoo devil ceremony that is, is how Haitians got their, their independence. And so in 300 and some years later, this person is saying that's the only reason why these bad things happen to people is because they're evil and they've made a deal with the devil. Hey guys, welcome back. Now it's time for a little pre-critic. Hey, there's a movie coming out. And uh, I'm going to judge him before I even kind of see him or know anything about him. So this is how it works. Let's start. Okay. Remember Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell movie where uh, basically a rich lady uh, is on a yacht and her mechanic guy is like, oh, you're being so rude to me. It's like, I don't care. I'm, I'm rich. I'm entitled. Blah, blah, blah. And Kurt Russell's like, rah, 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 rah. and then she falls overboard, hence the movie, and bumps her head and loses her memory. Kurt Russell finds her and is just like, you rescued me. Who are you? And Kurt Russell's like, hmm, I'm going to kidnap this uh, rich lady and force her to be uh, my wife. So that's kind of what happens now. But imagine that gender swap. There's a movie, just like that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Anna Ferris is going to be in this movie, and she's pretty funny. I like her. Nothing wrong with her. She's great. Uh, <laughs> Truth or Dare uh, is a movie uh, based on the popular game where you say truth or dare. But let's ha add a little bit of horror element in there. So imagine a movie uh, where, I don't know, from what I saw from the trailers, there's weird smiles. And it's kind of creepy. So the whole idea is that if you don't do a truth and or dare uh, when you're told to, then you die. Like in a very weird fashion. Because I remember I was watching the trailer and some guy was just like on a bar stool or whatever. He's like, do a striptease. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do a striptease. I dare you to do a striptease. I'm not going to do a striptease. And he fell off and he hit his head and died. But it made it look a lot more violent because, heck, it's a, it's a horror movie made with a bunch of good-looking people. And usually with those movies, they start with the least good-looking person and work their way up to the best good-looking person. And it's usually the one who's the more timid one who's just like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Oh, everybody's dying around me. I just don't get it. And, you know, they're the, they're the last ones that die. And they're like, I do get it. Maybe I can solve it. And, uh, oh, the whole idea of the scalpel to the head is there. There seems to be a trend with horror movies where, like, people are, like, staring at scalpels. And then they just, like, stab themselves with the scalpel. But this movie has a scene, um, which is, I don't know, it's not really that, like, appropriate. But it's, like, hilarious because it's, like, a guy puts a scalpel, he stabs it in his face, and then he bangs his face against a wall. And I'm just, like, the, the way it looks is so phony looking it's kind of hard to really kind of i don't know it, this whole movie is just kind of ridiculous and it has a bunch of good looking people playing truth or dare or die they might as well just call this truth or die it would have been a lot better title anyways this next movie is called the rider it looks like it's a very independent film it released in a lot of indie films and whatnot and it's very montana-esque image not available but after a near fatal injury um i'm here to present a movie about a rodeo clown no wait 
a rodeo guy who has overcome adversity when he suffers from falling off a horse, uh, but can't get back on because um, he has the seizures and other uh, traumatic ba brain injury. It's a modern Western that talks about stereotypes and how siblings must act like siblings in this movie. Uh, I, I, I thought it was a documentary because the way the camera is used, it's like filmed in a way that looks almost like a documentary. And the acting's pretty interesting, and it's it's like the guys the guy is just like really quiet, and everyone's around here. If you want to go kill yourself, go kill yourself. And I don't know, it, it, that just kind of how the acting is. It's kind of like very just uh, dry kind of acting. So if you want to go see that, great. I'm sure if there's some kind of Montana element, people in Montana would be like, I don't want to go see that. Far be it from me. All right, that's the end of the pre-critic. And this movie was made here in Missoula. And uh, it was made by a couple uh, cute little kids. And this is uh, basically their interpretation of Pennywise the Dancing Clown. So without further ado, here is Flagship Friday. And when I come back, I got plenty of city council. <laughs> Well, see you later. I have to go to the bathroom. Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for a little bit of city council. If you guys uh, don't know what it's all about, 
let me give you a nice little flyover of some of your committee and other meetings that happened uh, during your Wednesday committee meetings at the city of Missoula. Pfft, I don't know where I'm going at, but okay. So the current bike parking section, Title 20, is kind of loose. So what they decided to do is be like, hey, man, let's actually update this and try to figure out what's the best uh, practices when it comes to making bike racks here in the city of Missoula. So Ben Weiss, uh, with the bike uh, pedestrian board, um, came down and gave an update of some of the uh, problems that they have and what they want to do to help solve some of the issues when it comes to p bike parking in the downtown um, Missoula area. So here is Ben Weiss kind of giving a nice little introduction. While it is largely a very good chapter, there are, uh, we've noticed some things, some reoccurring issues over the last five or six years that I've been in a position that uh, I think we should be able to um, just help improve the code to improve the user experience. Uh, when bicyclists show up at a new bike rack, it'll be a, a better rack if we make a couple changes, and we can help um, make the whole process more predictable for developers. Uh, currently, there's a there's, while we, it's good that we allow some flexibility, there's an element of uncertainty about numbers and about styles that um, I think we can clarify a little bit more. So um, just going to go over why bike parking chapter needs updating, what the scope of the project, uh, what we're thinking it looks like so far. All right, so that was uh, Ben Weiss with a nice little introduction. I just kind of give a little flyover of some of the things that need to be done. As an informational only item, Ben, talk about the level of frequency to the level of congestion that occurs in popular bi biking by bicycle rack spots and racks that don't look as good as such as uh, a wave rack so the idea of a wave rack is that it's basically two pillars side by side and then it doesn't touch the ground and it waves kind of like this so it, it's kind of like it, it, it adds a, an interesting level of parking and uh, Ben Wise is the big, biggest critic of this one in particular so ideally um, with most businesses in development that have a business, they want to have 10% uh, parking for bikes compared to how many parking spots they have, which honestly isn't that much when you talk about the downtown area. So a lot of times the city of Missoula has a, a, like a right of way, but they don't even have, it's kind of like, it's like, hey, can we uh, I propose having a bike rack on this section? It's like, okay, cool. But at this point, it's just like, there's no like solid ruling or solid saying about what, what we, um, the city can do when it comes to making bikes. So of course, Ben requests that the city thinks about having bike standards for the city of Missoula, and this is what he has to say. So some of the approaches that I'm gonna look at in this rewrite are um, performing a comparative analysis, looking at best practices from other US cities, and I'm gonna lean heavily on the Association of Pedestrian and Bike Professionals. They, in 2015, they put out a very comprehensive uh, bike parking best practices guide. Um, and so there's, I don't need to recreate the wheel a lot. There's also going to be um, some public process. I'm uh, going to be in touch with the Organization of Realtors and uh, the Building Industry Association, among others, to find out what they want to see and what their uh, goals are as developers um, and make sure that we're aligned with them. Um, All right. So uh, basically the whole idea is that they want to create a policy along with updating the Title 20 policy on biking without um, overreaching their uh, um, their authority when it comes to ba ma making bike racks. So if you want to start a business here and be like, hey, you have to make a bike rack, a lot of times uh, a lot of the questions that were floating around there back and forth is like maybe like Missoula Bone and Joint it was one of the examples. It's like you, a lot of times when people are going there for uh, getting um, – doing some stretches and doing all that stuff they don't have the option to ride a bike because a lot of times they don't need to ride a bike because they're not they're they're uh they're in recovery and they're doing some physical therapy and biking um isn't one of those things that uh, is uh available to most of them so that was kind of like one of the things they talked about so they want to like create a bike rack where they don't need it so a lot of this is an assessment determining which areas need bike racks and which areas don't. And depending upon the seasonal uh, time period, let's say you go to Karis Park, and uh, like one of the biggest things in Karis Park is there's not actually that much uh, bicycle parking. They got a lot of nice little silver like bike racks, which can probably um, share comfortably two bikes on there. Of course, if you've seen a couple of the bike racks in the Karis Park, especially during um, out to lunch and um, Thursday uh, dinner in the park downtown tonight, um, you can see how sometimes they can get pretty congested with a lot of bikes there. 
especially if there's a big event happening as well. Of course, this meeting follows uh, Ben trying to talk himself into standards in different types of areas that could take a couple of months before we have an action item uh, for discussion. Of course, Myrta Bercera reflects on an instance where there is more bike parking than motor vehicle. Um, I think it's much needed, and I echo what John just said. Um, I was wondering, I remember when the Homeward um, Gold Dust project um, was built in the north side, they, um, they were able to have less parking um, because they were providing more bicycle parking. I wonder if, if that's um, in our current standards, or is there a, a possibility for that to be an incentive for developers to just, you know, perhaps be allowed to not follow their requirement right now if they provide um, a considerable amount and facilities for bicycle use. So that is in our current standards. You're allowed to remove um, one space for every eight additional long-range bike parking spaces you provide. Um, and you're allowed to use that to remove up to a quarter of your parking, your car parking spaces. Um, but again, I, what I think we've seen a lot of developers took the opportunity to do that when it was first adopted, but the long-term parking that they built was most often in storage units, and so then it wasn't utilized appropriately. So yeah, that's one of the things that we want to look at providing some better guidance on and making that, um, not just giving developers the opportunity to do that, but to make sure that the bike parking they're building then is actually usable for someone who's replacing a vehicle trip with a, or v replacing a vehicle with a, with a bike. All right. So that was one of the uh, things they wanted to help clear up when it comes to developers and making businesses and whatnot. Many adjustments that Ben wants to look into the short term versus long term parking areas to provide folks who want to leave their bikes in place for long periods of time can, and they have pavilion made just for those bikes while other short-term parking can be uh, which is considered two hours or less the long-term parking is usually around two hours more eight hours overnight kind of deals um, but they have uh, basically they want to uh, be able to have the short-term parking parking in um, places of view which basically means if you're at a coffee shop or you take a bike to a date or whatever and you're just kind of sitting there you can basically see if someone's trying to steal your bike that's kind of like what the whole idea is they want that to be more short-term parking and long-term parking to be in areas where they basically can be easily monitored even if your bike is stolen in the long term so it's bike safety but also a lot of bike preventative type stuff that they want to work on in the future as well so community of the whole is uh, here, and they were talking about Missoula Aging Services comes down to talk about an update. They have a lot of budgeting problems, and even more people are going into the 55, 65 and older range, uh, which is uh, due to increase 55% in population in the next 15 years in the state of Montana. So Susan Kohler with MAS talks about their budget problems. We view it as a partnership. Um, you know, certainly we ask the older adults to pay what they can afford to uh, pay. We're not an organization that just serves poor people. Um, resources in terms of navigating the long-term care system is pretty much uh, anybody that has to do that of any income finds it very confusing and frustrating, and that's why we're there. But we do have um, a significant amount of individuals that are lower income. Our Meals and Wheels program is a good example. For whatever reason right now, it seems that a majority of people who receive that service are low income. It's not a requirement. Um, it could be of any economic um, uh, situation. Uh, we get a lot of referrals for people who are discharged from the hospitals, and at least for temporary, but more and more we're getting people who are aging in place that need to continue those meals. Um, and is it an indicator that one of the primary indicators why they are able to stay at home is because they have somebody checking in on them every day and getting a nutritious meal. Okay, many of the programs in place that uh, the uh, Missoula Agent Services are losing is a lot of those uh, um, um, programs that inver uh, involve a senior companion, just like the, the, a lot of the uh, federally funded backed um, organizations that help Missoula Agent Services get grants for money this, for this kind of thing. See, a senior companion program is basically, as it sounds, is a senior companion. So. Um, Susan talks about exactly what they are losing in this next uh, clip that I have for you guys. 
Um, this next year, starting in July, again, we're looking at the state, unless that some miracle happens, they'll continue with that reduction. We no longer are getting United Way funding. Um, United Way has changed their initiatives, and, um, and we don't fit in that anymore, so we'll be losing that money. Um, uh, senior Corps, uh, that primarily is a senior companion program, they got paid uh, with Medicaid dollars because they served as companions for Medicaid waiver clients, which are low-income seniors who are at risk of entering a nursing home, and the state uh, provides the match money to create what they call slots and then they have a budget similar to veterans um, to figure out how to provide those supportive services so they can stay in their own home and one of those services was having a senior companion come in to be their companion and they paid us through the Medicaid dollars to do that um, because of the cuts to Medicaid at the state level they eliminated that service to the older adults so that'll be a loss of 10 thousand for us. So the total as far as we know is roughly $41,000 but as you all are aware um, the federal situation is um, scary to say the least where you have a tax reform that's increased our um, debt and our programs federally are considered discretionary that puts us at risk. Um, All right, so as you can clearly see, $41,300 in a total reduction for Missoula Aging Services. So that's a lot of programs that a lot of these things help fund with helping um, adults um, 65 years or older to help them stay inside their homes. So that's just something to kind of think about as we go on to our next topic, the budget. So the city of Missoula had a budget review the last two weeks. Last week they talked about the city and fire department. This week they're going to be talking about parks and recs, public works, and the general fund were all talked about during the budget review committee meeting. Of course, we'll start with Donna Gockler out of Parks and Recreation. She's the general manager, and she talks about the general fund operating budget, and as of January 1st was the biggest change in the intergovernmental agreement between the city and county-owned portions of Fort Missoula Regional Parks, parks which all involve... You guessed it, maintenance of the park. Don <laughs> Donna Gockler expresses some concern over the vendors and concessions in the future parks in, in terms of having them. I, I think um, some of our budget projections on the original grill van were um, overly optimistic, I'll put it that way. I think that the intent was that maybe that grill van would go places uh, like Cares Park out to lunch and Thursday nights, and I, we felt that that was unrealistic from a um, balancing competition versus service and the purpose. Yep. And so we're trying to realign our numbers, and we'll, that should have been changed a year or two ago to be more realistic about what those revenues could be. Okay. That said, we're still generating sufficient revenue, meeting our goals from an entrepreneurial standpoint, with uh, Fireline Grill, the Crazy Creek, and then we hope to add on, you know, the home plate doing that same thing. Um, but yeah, those are, that's a dream for us, uh, but I think it'll take us a while to get there. Okay. Yep, so basically the current uh, projections right now aren't looking um, as well as they would hope, but a lot of times th their projections in the future are looking pretty good as well. So. Um, Donna Gockler talks about budget issues um, in terms of trends and what they're doing to help solve these problems. This, but among the leaders in the state, uh, among our peer communities, and lowest number of FTEs per acre and lowest budget per per acre, um, not at the very bottom. We're somewhere in the middle to lower, and I think a lot of that is uh, our success is. Um, so getting as efficient as we possibly can with as skilled a staff as we can and in, in using things uh, like GPS to determine greatest efficiency of routes and reducing windshield time. On the other side of it, we're not keeping up with maintenance. Um, we have about, this is really gross numbers at this point, but I suspect in unfunded new facilities that were brought on in the last two years and new facilities that will come on in the next year to two to 18 months, there's close to $250,000 of routine annual maintenance that we have not yet funded. 
and there's probably about $5 million in deferred maintenance in parks that look like picnic shelters, restrooms, irrigation systems. All right, yeah. so that's kind of like it in a nutshell of what how, how much money has to be raised and how much money they need to defer um, to uh, basically pay for a lot of this stuff. Um, yep. It's all about uh, they're going to be kind of like in the red for a little while, but they said that if, if everything goes better, the budget won't be as uh, big. So Donna Glocker is confident that it'll turn around pretty quickly as soon as Fort Missoula Regional Park is fully operational. All right, moving on. Public Works are next on the ticket, and Supervisor of Missoula Water, Dennis Bowman, came to talk about budgets and upcoming projects. There were some projects that weren't able to get through through uh, the contracting phase. So here's Dennis uh, Bowman, and he talks about some of the uh, biggest- And very, growth. very fortunate because um, right now Missoula is growing. So every time a connection gets added on, that's additional revenue and stuff. And fine tuning the revenue projections over the next five years and having that approximate of uh, our growth is for the next five years definitely helps us for projecting revenue more accurately. All right, so uh, Dennis uh, Bowman talked about uh, the uh, revenue, and uh, one of the things about the revenue is it claims that there's uh, five, uh, half a million dollars in revenue from the water systems, and the all expenses as a result of should go down as a result of acquisition of the company along with not being taxed for the fiscal year 2018, which also helps um, with this as well. And it is city owned, so there, there might be have some incentives between some tax breaks as well. So a lot of the money that would be going to maintenance um, and a lot of things are coming from the hookups. So if you think about it, because uh, developers who want to develop uh, areas that hook into the water main now have to pay Missoula Water, the water company, to do it. And a lot of times what uh, back in the day Mountain Water Company used to do is uh, they would um, hook it up and then they would come up with a, like a, a long, extremely long-term payment program. But now when developers develop their properties, when they want a water hookup, they have to pay that with developing the land as well. So it's kind of like all at once, get it out of the way, and there's no long-term payment plan, plan that Mountain Water basically did. And I heard at one point in one of the meetings that one of the payment plans were like 30 years to pay for the uh, water installment hookup. So it was kind of interesting how uh, the water company was kind of doing kind of like bank loan type rules. Um, but of course, uh, Dale Bickle, finance guy, he does claim that there's a half a million dollars in revenue from the water company. Uh, of course, Dale Bickle comes in to talk about the general fund, and general fund was the uh, the last thing that they talked about. He said he spent about uh, uh, 10 minutes on this, but he spent a little bit more time on this. Uh, but of course, uh, the general fund is at $800,000 in revenue as of right now. Um, but of course, overall, it's 977000 net net income thus far, and adjustments that will increase to about $1.7 million in about a year. Um, of course, a couple months ago, there was a budget uh, issue that happened in the city where a lot of times, uh, so the issue was very simple and they explained it very simple is that they had two different accounts. One account is for getting loans that pay for like uh, uh, new trucks and new vehicles for uh, public works and that kind of deal. But the general fund was the one that got the loan in the first place, which basically threw off the balance. And so a lot of times when they looked at the budget of the general fund, it was based on the loans that they got that they were paying. But a lot of times it, it's kind of like, um, Imagine that you're, uh, the, the issue was is that you're paying uh, uh, from one account thinking that you're paying with another account. So let's imagine you have two accounts at two different banks at a credit union versus your whatever bank that you have here and you take your money and you're just like, okay, so the money I have here is to spend on food and groceries. Okay, now I spent the money on food and groceries. Oh no, this is gonna throw off my whole system because the other money that I have is supposed to be for my mortgage. So a lot of times um, it's, it's just the different accounts and it throws off the whole kind of balance. So you, a lot of times it, that's what they kind of did. And they, uh, they, they say, uh, the city of Missoula says that they're pretty good at this point. Brian Vallelosberg does uh, have this last quote that I have from the budget committee that talks about this. You know, as we head into budgeting, um, newer members, old members, all of us, that, that fund balance target level at 7%, critically important number for us to uh, continue to work uh, at getting to. Um, 
I, I am very appreciative of uh, the administration's work in when we had that discussion in December at coming back and demonstrating to us that you've hit, uh, for all intents and purposes, where we, we hope to be to recover from, recover from that in a position to continue to work on it, um, and, and including road district and park district and, and such. So um, I think it sets us up well to get into that. Uh, any other last questions? All right, so that was Brian von Locksberg. Um, this is something that they will be discussing further and foremost with the Budget Committee, and you can watch the whole meeting to find out more information by logging on to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website to find out everything about Missoula in terms of your government. How do you find a permit to build? How do you find a permit to install water mains, uh, sewers, all that kind of stuff to learn about permitting and also, if you want to do a march, because, hey, Missoula likes them marches. If you want to do a march, you go to that website to find out how to get a permit to uh, have a march here in the downtown Missoula area, which is another march is happening tomorrow. It's the International Wildlife Film Festival is kicking off starting at 11 a.m. And I'll have more events after this uh, wonderful art clip courtesy of... Missoula Art Museum. I just, I, I literally had to look down just to double check, but I'll be back with all your events right after this. Hey guys, welcome back. I just want to thank our very own Rick Phillips for those wonderful clips that he gets from the Missoula Art Museum. And it's a, it's a flyover. Don't assume that is your experience at the Missoula Art Museum. You're more than welcome to go to the Missoula Art Museum anytime. Free admission, free expression. And of course, uh, a lot of times, uh, they're... Uh, the money that goes to the Art Missoula Art Museum is through membership, so you guys can sign up to and be a member by going to MissoulaArtMuseum.org and help support a lot of their classes that they uh, provide for the community to learn art uh, as a hands-on experience, not just some a place to go to look at art. You can also experience art as well. Um, let's talk about some events. Uh, starting this morning, you got the bas basic gymnastics for a bunch of the little pre-K kids. Mismo Gymnastics, Roots Acro Sports Center, and Missoula Indoor Sports Arena are the place to go for safe indoor fun for a lot of your kids. Um, well, the weather's going to get a little bit nicer, but it may, 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 may or may not for the next week or so, so it's a good way to kind of stay inside and kind of maybe uh, get uh, them, get their uh, sports legs going uh, before they head outside for some outdoor fun as soon as uh, spring gets a little warmer and summer starts rearing its old hot head. Tanny Tales and Storytime is happening indoors at the Missoula Public Library starting at 10.30 a.m. And this is from birth to five years of age, usually just before school for kids who are picking up books and are learning to read because kids learn nine new words a day according to the Missoula Public Library a synopsis of Tiny Tales. Into the whole plan, whole, <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, <laughs> I'm awful. Intro to whole plant food. Intro to whole plant-based foods. 
Missoula Food Bank is hosting an intro to whole plant-based foods with instructor Nada Smith. Learn about the benefits of whole, base, whole plant-based foods, like they say that a lot, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes in this free cooking class. And you can get to contact Jamie Breidenbach for more information at jamie at Missoula Food Bank, jamie at missoulafoodbank.org or 549 Zero five four three, and you can ask for Jamie, or you can go to her extension, which is two one three. Yarns and watercolor is happening at the Missoula Public Library starting at noon today as well. So if you're interested in yarns or watercolor, every Friday at twelve, you get to enjoy some watercolor and yarns. Trans. Relation Lecture. University of Montana hosts a creative writing program with a uh, visiting host, Don Mi Choi, at noon today to give a lecture titled Translation is the Mode Equals Translation. Um, is a anti neo colonial mode in the Del Brown room at the Turner Hall. She will give a reading of her poetry in the evening at 7 p.m. also at Turner Hall. Both events are free and open to the public and sponsored by UM Creative Writing Program, President's Writers in Resilience Resistance Series. So our President's Writers in Resistance Series. So the morning news is exciting. A chapbook titled Petite Manifesto and a wave pamphlet titled Freely Frayed. She's received uh, a writing award, a, uh, a Lannan Literary Fellowship, and Lucien Steich uh, trans Translation Prize. Wow. And that's all happening starting today at noon, um, also tonight at 7 p.m. Family Fun Time at the Missoula Y, YW, YMCA, is they believe in families need a place to play together. Family Fun Time at the Y provides an indoor all-weather play place where parents are welcome to join in the fun bounce houses tumbling mats, scooters, hula hoops, and more, uh, tables and comfy chairs to sit and have a snack or take a break to take. And of course, if your program is free, if you're a Y family member, it's $20, $22 per family without access to the Missoula Y facility. And it's offered uh, Tuesdays, 9 to 11.30, Thursdays, 9 to 11.30, Fridays, 3.30 to 5 p.m., Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Predator feeding at the Missoula Sectarium at 4 p.m. See which hungry um, anthropod is uh, going to eat another anthropod today. Or maybe something else that's an anthropod. So check it out, uh, Missoula Sectarium. You can go to MissoulaButterflyHouse.org for more information about them. 29th John R Rafato Business Startup Challenge. University of Montana Missoulians are invited to the, attend the 29th annual business startup challenge public event this event is followed will be followed by a reception with complimentary food and a no host bar in the Gilkey education building and it's an evening of networking inspiration innovation which supports students and their creative problem solving um, meet and mingle with the entrepreneurs investors and forward-thinking students vote for the people's choice and best pitch awards Doors open at 4:30 p.m. and it will go, and the winners will be announced at 7 p.m. because they have door prizes. And you can go to uh, tickets and grizz cards will be checked at the door. Judges, coaches, and contestants are exempt. Um, the reception will be held at 7:30 p.m. tonight as well. But it's the last best print fest and silk screen demonstration at the Zootown Arts Community Center starting at 5:30 p.m. It's classes and events. And it's great, and you get to check it out. And there's always an art installation there at the Zootown Arts Community Center. Um, and you can ask them about their new facility that they're going to be getting soon. Um, it's a little old time social family family concert. So, um, uh, in adjacent to Family Friendly Fridays, uh, Family Friendly Fridays is having a band play with family friendly music for the kids to dance and enjoy to, and while parents get some drink specials while their kids go crazy. Um, and that basically kind of wraps up some of your uh, daily events for those nights. But if you guys are planning on going out, out tonight, uh, Missoula Community Chorus, Cor Cor Missoula Community Chorus presents uh, Breath of the, I bet it's Breath of the Wild, Breath of Grace. And it's going to be at St. Anthony, St. Anthony Church at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Missoula to Memphis, Elbin release party. is going to be at Monk's Bar, Dead Hipster. I love the 90s dance parts of, like, 90s music. Enjoy it at the Ballander tonight. Uh, Violent Little Fish is going to be some rock and funk, funk music at VFW. Jones and Band is going to be at Union Club. Insufficient Funds is going to be at Sunrise Saloon. And the Mad Hat is going to be at Top Hat Lounge. It's going to be electronic DJ music. They usually don't have that too often at the Top Hat. They usually have live bands, but they're going to have uh, DJ music happening tonight at uh, at the Top Hat. But when I, I'm going to come back in a bit. 
I'm going to show you another art clip, and this is another one from the Mizzou Art Museum happening until April 27th. So at the end of this month, it'll be the end of this art installation, but you still have plenty of opportunities to go to the Mizzou Art Museum. It's just downtown. You can't miss it. Um, and then when I come back, I'll talk about you some Saturday events right after this. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some uh, Saturday events, if you don't mind. <gasps> Zombies in Zoo Town. Zo Zombies in Zoo Town Horde Day. So, Learn Inc. is doing a Zombie Day bucket list opportunity right here. Don't miss your chance to be a be in a zombie movie. The Aspire Project AMP is hosting Horde Day Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Learn Inc., which is 1345 Dakota Street, Missoula. They're filming final scenes for a Zombies in Zootown movie and need a horde of zombies for these shoots. The more extras, the better. AMP parents and students will be available to help with makeup, filming, sound, and costuming. $100 for full makeup and $50 for something smaller. And the more makeup you have, the better part you'll have in there as as well and a lot of the money does go towards learn Inc for a lot of their educational programs think of it as a educational co-op uh, by a lot of parents who come together and put their money in there it's like Endeavor learn Inc it's all cool it's great engineer that girl um, University of Montana hosts uh, Girl Scouts of Montana Wyoming engineer that girl uh, V it's the um, I don't know why it says V, or is it five, Roman numeral, is the Expo of All Things Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. STEM, they'll have challenges, activities for each age groups. There'll be informational booths with girls can learn about the newest and coolest developments in the fields of STEM. Uh, girls grades K through five will conduct experience designs and engineering and tinkering with robots. Those that are welcome are K through fifth grade girls. So it's for girls, and this is geared towards girls, uh, and it's sponsored by Girl Scouts of Montana and Wyoming. Uh, it's going to be at the UM Payne Native American Center at the university campus. So you go to the Oval, you turn, you basically look at Main Hall, and you look back towards this area, and that's the uh, the the UM Payne Native American Center. And this happens from 9.30 to 12, and it's $5 at the door, which is pretty good. Um, International Wildlife Film Festival, Wild Walk, and Wild Fest... Hey guys, if you like documentaries about those cute, uh, ferocious, amazing animals, it's kicking off in downtown Missoula at 11.30 a.m., which will be walking all the way to the Roxy Theater, which will have a bunch of uh, showings uh, t uh, Saturday night as well. Okay, let me actually read my notes. Uh, dance, crawl, sing, and slither through the downtown Missoula as the wild li wildlife parade roars down Higgins Street, ending at Karis Park for a wild fest. And... Yeah, it's going to be wonderful. So Wildfest uh, will kick off International Wildlife Film Festival week. So all week long, you get to see a bunch of International Wildlife Films. Uh, Saturday drop-ins are from 1 to 5 p.m. Um, if you're interested in stop animation and your kid is a, uh, an aspiring artist, um, kids age 9 to 14 years of age can come on down to MCAT, 500 North Higgins Suite 105. Again, that's 500 North Higgins Suite 105. To enjoy 
some stop animation. It's stop animation, we do some live action stuff. We don't like to limit anything. It's basically based on how creative the kid is and we try to push them to be the very best that no one ever was. Don't think about it too much. Uh, 2018 Montana Grizzlies Spring Football Camp is happening at the University of Montana. It's spring, um, 1 p.m. at the University of Washington, the Washington Grizzly Stadium. Bobby Helk will be hosting a kind of scrimmage game for the University of Montana Grizzly football team. Um, f um, and it's welcome for the whole family. And it's $5 each. So this is a spring kind of sports thing. It's $5 each. And the proceeds benefiting scholarships for student athletes. The International Wildlife Film Festival kicks off their first block starting at 6.45 p.m. at the Roxy. Um, they have a lot more happening out there. You can go check out theroxy.org for more information. Um, Amazonia, damned. Uh, 14 minutes directed by Aja Bogel of United Kingdoms. Amazonia, Amazonia, Damned, tells the story of a, uh, a people's struggle to protect the heart of the Amazon against one of the largest mega dam projects on Earth. The film shows how the brave warriors of this modern day fight an impossible war of hope and join its voice in, uh, to the growing course proclaiming the need to preserve our planet's remaining rainforests. So that's happening at the Roxy, and you can watch that. Um, of course, Every Man is playing at the uh, University of Montana. You guys can check that out. It's, it's a play hosted by the uh, UM Department of Theater and Dance, and it's going to be at the Masker Theater. The origins of this daisily humorous and poignant contemporary adaption uh, harken back to the 15th century morality play Every man realizes that when life comes too close, you are left with only your good deed, however many or few they may be. And the show runs from the 14th until the 15th, and they have matinees um, Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. Tonight is the last, tonight and tomorrow night is the last uh, showings at 7.30 p.m., so you have tonight and tomorrow night. Then, of course, you have tomorrow afternoon and Sunday afternoon to check it, check it out as well. So let's talk about... Um, other events that are happening that night as well. Um, you got the Missoula Old Time Social Community Square Dance at the Governor's Ballroom at the Florence Building. Uh, starting at 7 p.m. Starry Night over the M. Painting with a Twist is hosting a class. Um, let's uh, skip on over to some of your later night events for going out. Absolutely with Chris Moon. More DJ music. Um, karaoke at VFW. Shiver. Is going to be some miscellaneous music at the Union Club, so it's going to be some dance music and whatnot. Insu Insufficient Funds Band is going to be at the Sunrise Saloon. It's going to be at Country Music. Far Out West is going to be some funk music at the Top Hat Lounge. A lot of times, Sunrise Saloon and Top Hat Lounge are kind of like, they have a lot of bands that kind of sound like they could be country, but Top Hat usually has uh, the jam funk bands, while uh, Sunrise Saloon is just straightforward country. And they got a market for it. Okay, so that's basically all you guys need to know about some things that are happening in and around the city of Missoula for your weekend as well. And if you guys are interested in finding out more about my show, you can log on to wakeupmissoula.wixsite.com slash wakeupmissoula. See the little Lego guy? That was from my last show. Um, I just wanted to thank my two guests for coming on here as well. And as you... As you see from my shirt, I got a nice, wonderful shirt from Empower Montana, which will be hosting an event Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, Diversity Day is happening at the Missoula Art Museum. So, hey, I showed you a bunch of art clips. You guys can enjoy a bunch of art from, from the Missoula Art Museum. It's wonderful. It's great. And if you want more information about MCAT, we ask you to check out our focus group, which is happening. Um, Oh, it's not a focus group. It's a survey. You can win up $250. So if you take the survey, you're entered to win $250 of a gift card for, it's mostly just like downtown shopping. It'll be great. Check it out. So uh, mcat.org, take the survey here, or you can click on the link where the cat, please take the survey right meow. All right, so I want to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I have completely run out of time, and I've filled up the full hour. So thanks for joining me, and I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm.